wanted to introduce you today to one of the great small museums of Europe. And although I'll be showing you some of the highlights of the collection, I want to really focus on the history of the museum to talk, to talk about how and why it was founded. In particular, I want to explore the patronage of the museum's founder, Princess Isabella Czartoryska, who to this day is considered one of the great 18th century female collectors. But what motivated her? How did she become known as a great connoisseur? And by what means did she amass a collection that includes works by Raphael, Rembrandt, and Leonardo da Vinci, as well as antiquities, items of European and Eastern decorative art, and also, as we'll come to see, some rather improbable historical mementos. As we explore these questions, we will also touch upon the museum's less than tranquil past, a past that has made the current director of the museum describe the Czartoryski collection as, and I quote, an ark, in the sense that it is not just a repository of precious objects, in this case of art and of history, but also a vessel that has protected these works through two centuries of tempest. Like Kenwood, the Czartoryski Museum contains a small but select grouping of paintings. And just as Kenwood is described sometimes as the National Gallery of North London, so too this collection has been described as a national museum. In fact, it has been called the first national museum of Poland. And just like Kenwood is the vision of one great connoisseur, so too this museum owes its origins to the patronage of another great patron and collector of fine and decorative art, Princess Isabella Czartoryska. The museum is housed in the butcher's quarter of the old town of Krakow in a series of buildings, including the former city arsenal, which I'm showing you here, a monastic school, and a number of ancient tenement houses. These were required to house the collection in the 1870s, and the French architect Maurice Auguste Ouradou was commissioned to clothe these disparate buildings in a suitable neo-Gothic, neo-Renaissance style, linking the separate buildings with a bridge of size. In this location, the museum opened its doors to the public in 1876. And this shows the um, bridge of size, which links the um, two parts of the museum. As you can see, they're divided actually by a street. I'm showing one of the interior views um, of, of the um, museum as it is displayed now, the Gallery of um, Polish History. You can see it's quite a small series of rooms. Now today, the Czartoryski collection has approximately 336,000 exhibits and is one of Poland's most mu important museum collections. Now, amongst these objects that are in the museum um, are included 86,000 museum pieces, um, that's sculptures, drawings, prints, and objects of everyday use, um, sarcophagi, mummies, relics, weapons, coins, and the me memorabilia of the famous heroes of the past, as well as over 300 paintings. And these paintings are not just any paintings. The collection boasts two of Poland's most prized masterpieces, Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine and Rembrandt's Landscape with the Good Samaritan. The collection also includes 250,000 manuscripts, antique books, and valuable documents. As I mentioned at the, in the introduction, the collection has an extremely turbulent history, and most notably during the Second World War, um, when despite the best efforts to hide the museum's holdings, the treasures were found and pillaged by the German army. Now, the 20th century history of the Czartoryski Museum is worthy of a lecture in itself. However, today I really want to focus just upon the founding of the museum and the role of its first patron, Princess Isabella. So 
So I want to start really by looking at who she was and who, who in particular her family were. So although the museum opened to the public in Krakow in 1878, its origins lay 100 years earlier in the 70s, 1770s. And it's this lady we have to thank, Princess Isabella, who we see here in a portrait by Alexander Roslin. Isabella was born in 1746 with the title Countess Isabella Dorothy Fleming. Her father, George Detloff Fleming, had a prestigious and military and political career under the Saxon dynasty of Poland. He had been a general in the Polish Saxon army and grand treasurer of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So he was very much establishment figure. Isabella's mother was the princess Antonina Czartoryska. Unfortunately, she died shortly after her daughter's birth. Isabella's upbringing was entrusted to her grandmother. Now, her childhood was not a happy one. Isabella's grandmother lacked maternal instincts. Moreover, she did not harbor any ambitions when it came to the education of her young ward. Isabella, by her own admittance, also lacked the physical attributes that were considered conventionally attractive in the 18th century. As she would later write of herself, and I quote, I have never been beautiful, but often I happen to be pretty. My beautiful eyes render my face interesting. And I think Roslin, this portrait, captures that um, idiosyncratic charm that Isabella certainly had. One of her future lovers, Duke Armand Louis de Gontan, the, uh, sorry, I'll repeat myself, Duke Armand Louis de Gontan de Lausanne, was a bit more forthcoming when assessing Isabella's charms. And I quote um, the Duke, of medium height, but with beautifully shaped limbs, having the most beautiful eyes, the most beautiful hair, the most beautiful teeth, with dainty feet and a pale complexion, by the gentleness of her manner and gestures of unparalleled grace, Madame Czartoryska proved that, though not at all beautiful, one can be a person of charm. Now, alongside her personal charm, Isabella was fortunate enough to be to have one of the largest dowries in 18th century Poland, Lithuania. Even if she wasn't beautiful, this fortune made her one of the most desirable brides in the Commonwealth, and this was helped, not in small part, by her father's excellent political connections with the royal court in Warsaw and in Dresden. The most suitable candidate um, for her hand was found in her cousin, Prince Adam Kazimierz Czartoryski. A perfect match, it would seem, especially as the union would ensure that her fortune would remain in the family. However, one thing ensured that the marriage would not be one of love, the disparity in education between the young bride and her husband. The young Isabella was 15 when she married her 27-year-old cousin, Prince Adam Kazimierz. Adam Kazimierz was the highly educated product of the Enlightenment. He had been given an extensive education, was a devoted connoisseur of the arts, and also was politically motivated. For example, he wrote a number of plays and comedies. He was a committed bibliophile and amassed an extensive library at his Warsaw residence, um, known as the Sky Blue Palace. He was fervently committed to education, becoming the first Minister of Education um, in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and also privately founded a number of schools. In 1765, he founded the highly progressive periodical known as The Monitor, which popularized Enlightenment thought throughout Poland. He and his family formed a powerful political bloc known as the Familia, that dominated the political landscape of the Polish of Poland Lithuania in the last decades of its existence. Indeed, Prince Adam, who had been educated abroad, had been groomed by his family, the Familia, as a candidate for the elective Polish for the elective throne of Poland. 
and this shows um, the scene of an election of a Polish king, Stanislaus Augustus, um, in 1764, painted by Bernardo Bellotto. Now, this was the um, year of the election that Adam was being touted for. However, he demurred, and it was his first cousin, Stanislaus Augustus, who in fact um, was elected king in that year. And this is the so-called coronation portrait of um, uh, uh, Adam Kazimierz's and Isabella's cousin, Stanislaus Augustus. For Adam Kazimierz, Isabella was shockingly uneducated. Their wedding day was also marred by the young bride's appearance. The poor girl had just recovered from smallpox, which had left her face permanently marred with redness and pop, pop marks. And this was commented upon decades later by her lover, the Duc de Lausanne. However, her beautiful, moreover, sorry, her beautiful hair, one of her main attractive attributes, had fallen out. Her emaciated figure betrayed the seriousness of her recent illness. It is not altogether unsurprising that her husband's sister, Princess, Princess Elizabeth Isabella Lubomirska, was reported to faint in despair at the fault of her brother marrying such an unattractive and, in addition, such a stupid wife. Now, needless to say, neither sister-in-law ever developed a close relationship with one another. To remedy her lack of education, Prince Adam Kazimierz took his young bride on a number of extensive tours of Europe, including Great Britain, where she was entranced by such sights as Colebrookdale. And I'll quote um, from Isabella's journal of that visit. In this district, her visit to Colebrookdale, that is, in this district, they have built a famous bridge of iron. At night, the valley makes a most wonderful sight. In the depth, the River Severn flows. On all sides above are the great and luminous fires of the foundries where they smelt the ore, as if there were a multitude of volcanoes. The night of our arrival, the moon, in all its splendor, added to the vision with its delicate light, beautified the surroundings. Now, despite this rather rapturous um, uh, uh, experience of a moonlight lit uh, Colbrook Dale, Isabella was not altogether taken by Great Britain. And again, I quote, I will never be able to accustom myself to the climate and to the people. One is humid to the extreme and the other is unspeakably cold. One is bad for my health, the other is damaging my soul. The prominence of the Czartoryski Familia and their connections meant that the young, ill-educated princess was received everywhere in Europe. She met such figures, such figures, uh, uh, such towering intellectuals as Rousseau and Voltaire. She was presented to Marie Antoinette at Versailles, and she also met Benjamin Franklin. And in fact, whilst they were in Paris, in fact, she was so scared when um, meeting Franklin that as she later confessed, she burst into tears because of her nerves. The young Isabella certainly would not give one cause to think that in later years, she would be a formidable patriot, as well as a great collector of art. Upon marriage, Isabella moved into her husband's townhouse or residence, the Sky Blue Palace in Warsaw. Now, the Warsaw that Isabella and Adam, Adam Kazimierz moved to was a city characterized by great luxury and tremendous poverty. Visitors were amazed by the splendor of the town palaces of the aristocracy, which sat right alongside the hovels of the poor. Luxurious coaches would have to contend with the mud of the unpaved roads and streets. And then the painter Bernardo Bellotto gives us a wonderful visual record of how the city appeared in the 1760s and the, and the 1770s in a cycle of paintings commissioned by the Czartoryski's cousin, King Stanislaus Augustus. Now, despite this, it was a very fashionable city 
And Casanova was of the opinion that this carnival season in Warsaw was the most splendid that he had seen of any European city. Now, that's quite a compliment coming from, the, from a son of Venice. It was, city, it was a city also that was undergoing dynamic cultural change in the fields of architecture, patronage, and collecting. Isabella's cousin, the king, amassed a considerable private collection of paintings containing just under, just un under 2,550 works. Added to this was his collection of modern and antique sculptures and his collection of casts after the antique. As part of the progressive attempts to reform Poland politically and economically, the king and his circle even put forward a proposal to found a Museum Polonicum, or Polish Museum, along the lines of the British Museum. However, Isabella's life in Warsaw during the 1760s was not dominated by such cultural concerns. Moving into the sky blue palace with her husband, they largely left separate lives, as one observer noted, and I quote, the prince asks me, when you return from home, what will you say about Warsaw and about my house? I shall say that the prince does not have a wife. How so, replied the prince. For, I replied, I have been a guest for over a year in the prince's home. I saw and was told only at a distance that this was the princess, but never once what she, but she never once was at table with me, nor did I ever see her with any other member of our company. Instead, Isabella's life in Warsaw during the 1760s was dominated by and large by pleasure. She had a string of high-profile lovers. The Russian ambassador to the court at Warsaw, Nikolai Repnin, Armand Louis, the Duke of Lausanne, and with her cousin, the king himself. It was whispered that of her five children, only her firstborn daughter was actually the son of Prince Adam Kazimierz. Despite this, these children further strengthened the Czartoryski familia, for example, one daughter marrying the Duke of Württemberg. Isabella had little time for serious political or cultural activities. Having seen the hameau of Marie Antoinette at the Petit Trianon Versailles, she decided to create her own version in the suburbs of Warsaw, a park called Stare, Stare Povonski. Now, today it is the oldest and most beautiful cemetery in Warsaw. However, before it was destroyed during the Polish uprising against Russian occupation in 1794, Isabella laid out a delightful sentimental park in the English style. She employed the architects Shimon Bogumiuzuk and Ephraim Scherger, and employed her painter Jean-Pierre Nordlin to assist in realizing her vision. And this park consisted of a series of pavilions to house her family and staff, and of course for her, a pavilion for herself, that seemingly from the outside looked like simple thatched peasant huts. Inside, however, the, the apartments were decorated in the most modish and lavish manner. Isabella also included um, a series of artificial ruins to enliven this sentimental landscape. I'm showing an image <clears throat> a view of um, the triumphal arch at Povansky. Um, and although we don't have um, many um, images of the park itself, of these um, beautiful um, uh, uh, exquisite cottages that um, uh, her architects designed, um, this design by Shimon Bogumilzog, dating to around about the same period, um, gives us an impression of what Povansky might have looked like. You can see on the right-hand side a um, ramshackle mill, and on the left-hand side that's juxtaposed with this extraordinary um, ruined classical colonnade, evoking the ruins, of course, of, 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 um, that one could see during the Grand Tour of Italy. And again, another design that uh, 
isn't um, ident hasn't been identified as being for Povonsky, but showing the type of um, uh, interiors that um, Zog designed for the princess and her family. Um, this uh, design for a six columned uh, for a cottage with a six columned saloon. As you can see, the exterior is very rustic. The cottage itself is thatched, but once you go inside, you're greeted with this beautiful neoclassical interior very much in the style of, of um, Louis the Sixteenth, very much in the style of what one can see to this day at the Hamot in Vers uh, at the Petit Trianon at Versailles. And descriptions, we do have descriptions of the these um, um, structures that Isabella commissioned. Um, and I'll just quickly read one of them to give you a flavor of what um, these rooms were like and how um, expensively they were fitted out. Um, so a Swiss visitor to Warsaw wrote, having seen, to, seen one of these interiors, in the last room of the upper floor, there is a hidden niche by which through the help of a special mechanism, one might lower oneself to a lower chamber this chamber is a bathroom, but what a bathroom. The bath is hidden beneath a niche under a sofa upholstered in costly cloth of gold. The walls are covered in real porcelain tiles, painted with the most exquisite designs and with gilt frames. I counted 600 such tiles, and each tile, which is easy to believe, was priced at one ducat. So incredibly expensive. <laughs> Now, Povonsky were the setting for delightful society gatherings that recalled the Fête Galante of Vatot, and which were the subject of a series of paintings by Isabella's court painter, Jean-Pierre Nordlin. And you can see here a, a gathering in one of the groves at Povonsky, all very pastoral, all very bucolic. And no doubt it's Princess Isabella in the hat in the center of the composition that is being greeted um, by her guests. Again, this shows another of these fêtes um, at Provensky. Uh, in this instance, again by Jean-Pierre Jean Nordlin, in this instance, um, a, a sort of masquerade on ice or a fête on ice with artificial illuminations in the background and a rather splendid um, uh, tent in which the um, guests are, are being entertained. Now, Isabella's passion for founding gardens would result in her publishing two works on the subject in the early 1880s. Um, various thoughts upon the arrangement of gardens, 1880, 1805, um, and I'm showing a plate uh, from this publication. What was interesting about Isabella's particular approach to um, garden design was that she advocated quite strongly in her pub two publications for the use of native species. So not the use of imported exotic species from India, China, or indeed from the Mediterranean world, but actually using native species, Poland, Lithuania, in, in her gardens. This is really, I think, one of the first occurrences of a gardener advocating the use of native specimens. Now, uh, Isabella's carefree life devoted to society pleasures, to gardening, would be interrupted by the first of three tragedies that would eventually see the removal of Poland from the map of Europe, the partitions. During the first partition of Poland, sorry, the first partition of Poland had found Isabella and her, her husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz, in London. The prince suggested that they stay in England selling their various estates and lands rather than to return to their gradually fragmented homeland. Their wealth and connections would allow them to live on the highest footing. But it was the princess who showed remarkable steel at this moment. I quote, in a letter written to her husband, she stated, I have told you already, and I repeat it, that by inclination and perhaps by habit, I am strongly attached to Poland and that it is there that I shall always choose to live. One can still do some good in our country. Now this last sentence marks a profound change in Isabella. 
the trauma of seeing her country dismembered by its neighbors, and the inability of her cousin, the king, to adequately respond to this tragedy, awakened a sense of responsibility and patriotism that was not evident in the pleasure-seeking princess of the 1760s. It would also see the princess and her husband abandoning their life in Warsaw in order to forge a new political and cultural center outside the capital. The first partition of Poland caused a rupture within the Czartoryski political party. Isabella and her husband blamed their cousin the king and his lack of political will uh, to be for the unfurling of the tragedy. Relations became so animonious that Isabella confided to a close friend that she fears that her cousin, the king, and he was, of course, her former lover, was plotting to have her husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz, poisoned. It was time to leave Warsaw. The Czartoryskis abandoned their properties and moved the center of their activities to one of their estates, a place called Puave. Although the house at Puave was not a huge palace, it was one of exceptional charm. It was built in the 17th century and at the time was considered one of the most elegant residences in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In fact, a French visitor described the house and its site. On the bank of the Vistula, there lies a pretty little village at the foot of a hill, whose summit is surrounded by a small palace in the Italian style of beautiful structure. It has wonderful antechambers, ornamented with marble, and a most magnificently appointed salon. This little house is without doubt the most beautiful example of the more recent architecture in Poland. Now, coming from a French visitor, that actually is quite some praise. One of the reasons why the palace was considered so beautiful was in fact that many French craftsmen worked on the interiors. And this 18th century print shows the saloon um, after it was remodeled for the Czartoryskis by the French, the great French Rococo architect, Juste Aurel Messonnier, um, remodeled in the 1730s. Um, and we can see that the carved white lacquered and gilt wooden panels and boiseries, um, which were designed by Messonnier, were um, augmented by beautiful painted decorative panneaux. And these were um, created by Francois Boucher. Um, both the boiseries, the panels, um, were, and the paintings were all executed in Paris, specifically to fit this room perfectly. They were then shipped to Poland at huge cost. Moving to Puave, Isabella and her husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz, did not go alone. They took with them those members of their family and political followers that sided with them against the king in Warsaw. Located strategically on the Vistula River, the palace and the state soon became a political and artistic center that was intended to quite deliberately rival that of their cousin, the king in Warsaw that of their cousin, the kings in Warsaw. Prince Adam also moved his imposing collection of books into the palace. The artists, political thinkers, writers, architects, and designers who all took up residence on the estate gave Puave the nickname of the Polish Athens. The palace was enlarged and in the surrounding gardens, Isabella indulged in her passion for garden design. Now, although they had left Warsaw to live at Puave, it does not mean that the Czartoryskis did not participate in public life. The princess engaged quite actively in politics during the so-called four-year same or parliament, whose culmination saw the ratification of the 3rd of May constitution in 1791. Isabella, as a woman, was not strictly allowed to participate in the parliamentary debates, but she certainly was allowed to observe the proceedings from the public balcony and actively influence what was being discussed. You can see the public balcony, and indeed you can see a woman in the center, uh, in the foreground of this view of the passing of the 3rd of May Constitution, 1791, um, showing the senatorial chamber 
of the Royal Castle in Warsaw, where the constitution was both debated and passed. <clears throat> she was reported to um, loudly acclaim those speakers she supported, even sending her servants to present her favorites who had taken the floor with bunches of flowers after debates. Both Isabella and her husband's anti-Russian stance brought the attention of a very dangerous enemy, Catherine the Great. In fact, Catherine the Great was said to have stated that it was Princess Isabella herself who had formulated the plans for the 1794 Kosciuszko insurrection against Russian political and military involvement in Poland. As a result, Russian troops were sent to Kwabe to sack the palace. The Czartoryski's estates were confiscated. Isabella was bereft. Nevertheless, she uses this disaster to articulate her feelings in a distinctly romantic, sentimental tone. And I quote from Isabella's journal, I have seldom in life seen such a sad vision. The moon in its fullness sent forth its light, and entering the avenue of lime trees, my heart was pained at the thought of all the disasters, pillaging to which Puave had been victim. Entering the courtyard, silence, loneliness, and quiet were the first to terrify me. Looking at the palace without doors and windows displaying emptiness, I could not keep myself from crying. The pale light of the moon illuminated clearly everything. In the middle of the forecourt was a mound piled up from the actual fragments of Diva's furnishings that I could not that the, they could not take with them, that is the Russians. The Moscovites broke them, and my people brought them together, the heads, hands, and legs of marble statues, pieces of porcelain, crystal, paintings, mosaics, broken mahogany harpsichords, objects in, every, in ebony, everything lies in ruin together. The devastation of Puave would turn out to be short-lived, however. How, having confiscated the Czartoryski's property, Catherine the Great relented and allowed the family to move back. There was a catch, however. In order to ensure Isabella and her husband's good behavior, their two sons, Prince Adam Yedi, sorry, Prince, Princes Adam Yezhi and Constante Adam, were taken to St. Petersburg as hostages, ensuring their parents' good behavior. In particular, Prince Adam Yezhi shared his mother's interests in collecting. Although he had been sent to St. Petersburg to guarantee his parents' good behavior, it turned out that at the Russian court, he couldn't behave, behave himself. Adam Yezhi took after his mother in more than one respect. He too was prone to having affairs. Unfortunately, the rumored object of his affection was a particularly dangerous one. Louise of Baden, Empress Consort of the Russian Emperor Alexander I. And so in 1798, Prince Adam Yezhi was made Russian ambassador to the court of Charles Emmanuel IV of Sardinia, who was now out of St. Petersburg, away from the Russian court. The position was really a sinecure, as Charles Emmanuel did not in reality possess a kingdom. Now, this allowed the young prince to undertake a leisurely tour of Italy and also to act as his mother's agent in the acquisition of objects for her collections. With the estate secure once more, Isabella set about rebuilding. She and her husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz, engaged their architect, Piotr Egner, to rebuild the palace in 1800. Gone were the de delightful interiors by Messonnier, and instead the new palace was characterized by a more sober classicism. The gardens were remodeled in 1798 by the princess, with the help of her British-born landscape garden designer, Jane Savage. And what's notable about the princess's um, redesign of these gardens was the development of an idea that she would create a public museum, not within the palace itself, the rebuilt palace, but rather within the setting of this landscape garden that Savage and she 
laid out at Puave. <clears throat> Her collections would be housed in two cabinets of curiosity that the princess entrusted um, again, her architect, Egner, to erect in the grounds of the park. Um, two pavilions, the so-called Temple of Sybil, which I show here, and the so-called Gothic House, which I'll come to. The Temple of Sybil was the first building to be completed, and it was intended to house the collect uh, Isabella's collections relating to Polish history. The form of the building was highly symbolic. Egner based the structure on the well-known Temple of Sybil at Tivoli, a ruin sited dramatically above a precipice and waterfall, and which was one of the must-see ruins of antiquity that 18th century grand tourists um, would visit. Aigner also sited his version of the temple on the edge of an escarpment overlooking the Vistula River, and in addition, the surrounding area was landscaped with large boulders in order to create a more dramatic setting. Aigner's temple, though, was twice the size of the antique original and contained two chambers for the display of historic relics. Above the entrance, the princess caused an inscription to be carved, which explained the purpose of the building. It read, the past to the future. The choice of the Temple of Sybil at Tivoli as an inspiration was highly symbolic. The temple was thought to have housed an oracle which foretold the future of the Roman people. In creating her own temple of the Sibyl, Princess Isabella was making a statement about her own hopes for and vision of a future Poland. The preserving of objects of national importance in the temple, as we'll see, from the past of a nation that had been wiped off the map of Europe, by this she hoped would serve a future reborn Poland. Access to the temple, to the interiors, was granted by use of this key, which was designed by the princess herself. And again, it's highly symbolic in form and nature. The key is in the form of a catechus, the staff of Hermes, the god Hermes. And there's multi-layered symbolic meaning here. Hermes was the messenger of the gods, but he also acted as a bridge between the living and the dead. He was also seen as the god of found things, and also as um, the god of thieves, um, people who steal. It's inscribed with in Greek, as you can see along the um, shaft of the key, and the and uh, the, the it reads in English, "I open the temple of memory." So once you gained access to the um, main chamber of the temple of the Sibyl. One entered a rather austere space. It was plain, tomb-like. In fact, the only um, architectural embellishment of this interior was a rather large niche, which you can see um, uh, in this image of the, of the interior as it appears today. Above this chamber um, was a glass dome with tinted glass, which illuminated the space with an ethereal violet light. This has since been replaced by plain glass. Now, this light also illuminated the objects that the princess had accumulated because they were shown in this chamber. Around the walls were arranged two huge mahogany cabinets containing historic relics. And also the walls were decorated with panoplies of armor um, from various Polish military victories, as well as a series of gilt bronze coats of arms that commemorated great Polish political and military figures. Within these mahogany cabinets, objects would be revealed one after another in a carefully choreographed manner, according to a sequence decided by the princess. So this space had a very specific didactic educational nature. That's how Isabella wanted her collection to be used. And of course, this was very much based on Isabella's own view of Polish history. Isabella explained the motivation for creating this display in her diaries. And I quote, Oh, my fatherland, I wanted to defend you. May I at least commemorate you? So we'll look at some of these objects in more detail. Um, for example, um, there were various uh, military objects captured as loot, taken as booty, 
from the siege of Vienna in 1683, which shows uh, a siege where Polish troops under the leadership of John III of Poland um, saved um, the Holy Roman Empire in Vienna. They raised the siege um, of, of Vienna. The collection also included extraordinary manuscripts, um, printed books and documents that illustrated the history of the Polish state, such as this work, the Pontifical of Bishop Erasmus Czołek, which shows the summary, um, which includes the um, ceremony for the crowning of a Polish king. In this case, it's the coronation of King Alexander the Jagiellonian. <clears throat> Now arranged above these um, items and um, on top of the two display cases were a series of small marble sarcophagi. And they, these contain fragments of the physical remains of the monarchs of Poland. For example, this casket contained the top of the skull of the first king of Poland, Boleswaf the Brave, taken from his grave at Poznan Cathedral. But the most significant object was placed right in the center of the of the arrangement within the niche, in fact, at the end of the main chamber of the Temple of Sibyl. It's this, the so-called royal casket. It faced directly faced the entranceway. It's almost enshrined like an altar, if you like. This casket contained the remains of the Polish crown jewels and other royal mementos that were gathered by um, Isabella's agents and other interested parties following the sack of the royal treasury in Krakow by Prussian troops in 1794. Only some 73 items of what would have been one of the greatest royal treasuries in Europe survived this, this um, sacking. Inside the casket were trays, um, containing their, these various objects. Um, for example, at the top, we can see a pectoral cross that belonged to King Sigismund the Old, it's a 16th century cross. Um, and to the uh, left, you can see in one of these drawers, um, a 17th century cutlery belonging to Prince Sigismund Kazimierz of the Vasa dynasty. It's a real, really disparate collection of objects. It's the fragments that remained um, from this extraordinary treasure that was looted in 1794. Now, Princess Isabella was delighted by the success of her arrangements for the Temple of Sibyl to such an extent that she shortly after decided to repeat the project by building a second pavilion, the Gothic House. This too was entrusted to her architect, Piotr Egner. But as you can see, the Gothic house was very different in feeling to the Temple of the Sibyl. It wasn't in a classical idiom, it was in a neo-Gothic uh, 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 form. The interiors, again, also demonstrated this neo-Gothic approach, and I'm showing you um, uh, the interiors as they appear, unfortunately, today, um, including the green room and on the um, right-hand side of the slide. That's an important room, so do remember what it looks like. And again, um, access was granted by a key designed specifically by the princess. In this time, appropriately enough, the key is in a Gothic style. And again, you can see there's an inscription on the shaft of the key. And it's in fact a line in Latin um, from Virgil's Aeneid. And the inscription states, I'll translate it, women lead in great things. Now the contents of the Gothic cottage were focused on a broader European history. The Temple of the Sibyl focused on relics relating to Polish history. The Gothic house looked at the European context. And these objects encompassed mementos, mainly relating to famous heroes, thinkers, lovers, and writers, initially when, um, the, temp when the Gothic house was, was created, um, such as this rather beautiful um, reliquary. It's a 17th century gilt and enamel cup and cover, and it contains the ashes of the great Spanish uh, uh, hero, El Cid. Some of these objects were given by as donations. Um, 
often by Polish soldiers engaged in fighting alongside the forces of Napoleon across Europe. That is how a number of rather unusual, if not downright impossible, mementos found their way into the collection. I'm referring specifically to um, uh, the two fragments that we see here, um, allegedly taken from the tomb of Romeo and Juliet in Verona, that um, uh, were, were given to Princess Isabella by a Polish soldier who was stationed with Napoleon's troops in that city, in Verona itself. Um, and you can see there are also other, other um, objects of famous lovers, um, relics of famous lovers that Princess Isabella managed to, to acquire. Um, within the oval glass that you see um, in the slide are relics of Abelard and Eloise. And the agate egg, the sort of egg-like container that you see um, has, uh, uh, contains relics um, um, the relics of Petrarch and his lover Laura. And again, we're not certain that Laura actually existed, although the poet Petrarch obviously did. Now, these rather unusual, if not improbable, objects did not go without comment. Her husband, Isabella's husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz, did not altogether take his wife's approach to collecting seriously. On one occasion, for example, he took off his footwear and asked his coachman to present it to his wife with an explanation that, in fact, his shoe had been the boot of Genghis Khan. However, not all the treasures that Isabella secured for her Gothic house were secured through don donations or other above board means. And I mentioned that. Um, Hermes, um, the god um, who seemed to preside over the temple of the Sibyl, was also the god of Thebes. Well, the princess was um, not um, averse to using uh, 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 downright underhand methods to acquire items for her collections, as I'll show. The marriage of Princess Isabella's daughter, Maria, to Duke Louis of Württemberg brought her close to Frederick II of Prussia. One day, she visited him at lunchtime at his Potsdam residence. Curious, she walked up to a desk strewn with papers, as she explained. I approached the desk and picked up a pen, still full of ink, with which he had just been writing a moment before. This very same Frederick II had torn my homeland apart. He was the cause of so many of our woes, and I was taking his pen as a valuable souvenir. I simply must tell you what occurred after I had taken the pen. A few days later, while I was attending a court luncheon, the king leaned over to me and said in jest that I had committed a theft in his room. Sire, I replied, that theft cannot be an insult to your majesty, for you must be a person of exceeding brilliance and exceptional fame if a Polish woman values your pen so highly. He laughed at this and was unable to reply. Isabella could also be ruthless. While in England, she visited Stratford, and in Shakespeare's house, she noticed a chair, the playwright's favorite place for work and relaxation. And again, I quote, sitting in that chair, Juliet, Romeo, Miranda, Desdemona, Hamlet, and Ophelia all sprang up in my imagination. I must confess that on seeing Shakespeare's chair, I vowed to have it by whatever means necessary, and transport it to the Gothic house. Indeed, my first request in this regard was rejected. After lengthy negotiations, 20 guineas settled the matter. Having the, exchanged the chair for money, the caring widow, the owner of the chair, gladly forgot all about it. Tartoreska goes on to describe how, while the mason was removing a chair, the chair from a, the wall to which it had been attached, the house owner's granddaughter, granddaughter who adored Shakespeare, hurled herself onto the chair at speed, clutching at it with all her limbs and finally her teeth, trying to hang on to it. We had to involve the local pastor who explained that her granny was poor and that the money would allow her to live more comfortably so she would be healthier. After a lengthy dispute, exhausted and fainting, she finally conceded to our pleas, but on the condition that at least the let chair legs would stay and become her property when she was older. 
And in fact, when you look at the chair today in the museum, you can see that the chair legs did not go to Poland. They remained at Stratford. Isabella had this rather extraordinary bronze frame in a classical style with the serpentine um, armrests designed to contain the back and the seat of the chair, the original wooden chair. The rest remained at Stratford. So as we might note so far, the collections started by Princess Isabella were very much tied up with the concept of historic personalities. These figures would be represented either by objects associated intimately with them, as was the case with Shakespeare's chair, or by their actual remains, as was with the case with the small marble sarcophagi containing the physical remains of Polish kings. A letter to her son, Adam Jerzy, clearly demonstrates her interests and motivations, and I quote, I am most delighted with the curios you have chosen for me for the Gothic cottage and those you have promised. Nothing has given me such pleasure for a long time. You are surprised that I have not ordered any paintings or statues from you. Well, the former are expensive and not particularly to my liking. Since I wish to complete my temple this year, I must save up all possible funds, denying myself in the, even the slightest whims so as to invest all the money into it. However, the nature of the collection would radically alter in 1801 when Princess Isabella's son presented her with what, what would be to us now an extremely attractive problem. In 1801, Adam Jerzy announced to his mother that he had acquired two paintings. The princess was faced with a dilemma. How could they be included in her program for her displays? her program was very much tied up with this idea of personality, famous historic personalities. The two paintings were portraits, in fact, Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine and Raphael's portrait of a young man. Isabella decided that the two portraits could enter the collection, not so much because they were great examples of art, but rather as paintings that could commemorate two historic figures. And it's fortunate for us that the princess did accept these works. For not only are, the, are they the two greatest paintings in the collection, but because they are two of the greatest Renaissance portraits in any collection worldwide. The lady with an ermine and Raphael's portrait of a young man. Now the lady with an ermine is considered by many to be Leonardo's finest portrait. However, its history has not always been clear. clear. Indeed, there are still some who question its attribution. It's known that in 1493, Leonardo did paint a portrait of um, a lady called Cecilia Gallerani. Uh, she apparently was a rather extraordinary figure. Fluent in Latin, she sang and played instruments and composed poetry. Later, she became the lover of Ludovico Maria Sforza um, at the court of Milan. And there she would preside over a philosophical salon. In 1489, she sat for Lodovico's court painter and engineer, Leonardo da Vinci. Painted from life, the portrait was soon recognized as one of Leonardo's most significant works. Indeed, in 1493, a poet called Bernardino, Bernardo Bellicchioni published a poem celebrating the portrait where he claims it would become Leonardo's, Leonardo's glory in every future age. Despite this hope that the painting would become Leonardo's greater glory in every future age, the painting was soon lost. The last mention of it dates to the 26th of April, 1498, when the great collector and art lover, Isabella d'Este, Marchioness of Mantua, wrote to Cecilia Gallerani with the request that she might borrow her portrait so that she might compare it um, alongside the works of the Venetian painter Giovanni Bellini. Cecilia gladly agreed, but replied with the caveat, and I read Cecilia's letter to the Marchioness, I would lend it more willingly if it resembled me more, and your ladyship must not think that this is due to, to any defect by the master himself, for, in truth, I believe that one could not find his equal. 
but only because this portrait was done at an age so far from, from fully formed that I have since completely changed so much that if you saw it and me together, there is no one who would judge it meant for me. Although we know that the portrait returned to Cecilia after a period of three months, from that point on, there is no record of it. That is until 1801, when Prince Adam Yeri sent it to him, his mother, Princess Isabella. By this time, though, the true identity of the sitter had been forgotten. Instead, if you notice at the tef top left-hand corner of the painting, there's an inscription which, which reads, La Belle Ferronière, Leonardo da Vinci. Although Princess Isabella recognized that the painting was by Leonardo da Vinci, she might misidentify the sitter as Madame Le Ferron, a mistress of the French king Francis I. Isabella accepted the painting into her collection not because it was one of Leonardo da Vinci's greatest portraits, indeed she was quite cavalier in her treatment of it, um, she, for example, repainted the original blue background black and added, of course, the um, mistaken inscription identifying the sitter. Nor did she accept the painting because it represented Cecilia Gallerani, the mistress of Lodovico Maria Sforza, a well-known intellect and beauty of her time. Rather, Isabella accepted it as it commemorated the life of one of the greatest kings of France, Francis I by being linked mistakenly to his mistress, Madame de Ferron. It was only in 1900 that the true identity of the sitter was revealed. Although Leonardo from the start had included a various obvious clue in the painting, one which give the, gives the work its name today, an ermine. Um, it's a play on words. Galena being um, uh, the Latin, the, the Greek, sorry, for an ermine. Despite the naturalism of Leonardo's treatment of Cecilia, and we know from Isabella d'Este's correspondence with Cecilia that it was painted from life, the animal that Cecilia holds in the work is not really a naturalistic depiction of a stoat in its winter coat, an ermine. The ermine in this painting is symbolical. In fact, a comparison with certain details of the painting and drawings by Leonardo shows that aspects of the animal's anatomy, anatomy have been based on the artist's studies of bears and of dogs. So if this isn't a painting of an actual ermine, why then include it? The answer, as I indicated, lies in a rather erudite play on words. The Greek for a weasel is gale, which form the first two syllables of Cecilia's surname. Further, the ermine also connects Cecilia to her lover, Ludovico Maria Sforza, as in 1486, he was bestowed with the chival chivalric order of the ermine by the King of Naples. The other portrait that Adam Yezri found for his mother was Raphael's portrait of a young man. Now, our understanding of this work today is hampered by the fact that since 1945, the work has been missing. In fact, the painting is listed as the most important work of art still missing from the Second World War. No color historic photos prior to 1945 exist of it. Any color images that we now have are based on historic black and white photos, which have been subsequently and artificially colorized. As with Leonardo, the identity of the sitter is not known. Um, but in the end, that was not important. Um, in this instance, Princess Isabella decided that Raphael, as an artist, was significant enough um, as a personality in his own right to warrant inclusion in her collection. Now, unlike the Leonardo, which disappeared, for want of a better term, by the 1500s, the Raphael portrait was known, um, as we can see by this, um, in this engraving by Paulus Pontius. It was known throughout the 16th century into the 17th century, um, although there's still no name for the sitter. Now, the sitter in Raphael's portrait of a young man is shown wearing a sable fur cloak thrown over um, a brilliant white shirt. And he's wearing this very distinctive um, uh, uh, soft beret. Um, 
the shit sitter is shown with no attributes that are identifiable. However, through the window, I'll show a uh, detail. Through a window, we can see a landscape with the distant walls and towers of a city. Now, could this be a clue to the young man's identity? Still a mystery. A comparison um, also with what are recognized as self-portraits by Raphael, um, such as the self-portrait he included in his fresco, The School of Athens, or this self-portrait in the Uffizi shows some clear similarities in terms of the treatment of all three subjects and their physiognomies. This visual evidence has led many to identify the subject of the Czartoryski Raphael as being in fact an idealized self-portrait of the artist. I'll just go back to the photograph of the original. And then here again, a close up of the face. As you can see, there are quite clear uh, echoes of the two um, verified self-portraits. Now, where the portrait currently is, we do not know. Um, in during the Second World War, the portrait was taken from the was found um, uh, 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 where it was hidden by the curators of the Czartoryski collection, um, and was taken um, to the residence of the military governor of the small part of Poland that was directly governed. Um, that was not being directly governed by, by that did not form part of the first Third Reich, directly formed part of the Third Reich, the so-called General Gouvernement. The portrait hung in um, the governor Hans Frank's apartments at the Royal Castle in Krakow. Hitler demanded it for his museum in Linz. It was sent there, but subsequently intercepted, and it has disappeared. We do not know where it is. It turns up from time to time, though. Um, in 2014, it made an appearance in um, the Monuments Man, the last scene of that film, a uh, film relating um, the, the um, attempt to redefine, to repatriate works of art that have been looted by the Germans from across European collections and museums. And the painting is shown in a mine being set on fire by German soldiers. This is a film. Also, more recently, the Polish government had in fact announced that the painting had been located. Um, uh, uh, they wouldn't disclose where, they wouldn't disclose who had found it. Um, the same day that they had made this announcement to the press, they later retracted the announcement. So we do not know what is going on, but art historians are confident it still does exist. The argument being that the painting is just too important, too valuable to have been destroyed in the war. We don't know. And in fact, in the newly refurbished Czartoryski Museum, uh, we can see an image of um, uh, one of the galleries here. The empty frame hangs alongside the Leonardo um, lady with an ermine waiting to be reunited with the actual painting. Now, with the acquisition of the Leonardo and the Raphael, the doors to the Gothic house were both literally and figuratively, figuratively open to the collecting of paintings. The third great painting that Princess Isabella acquired for display um, in the Gothic house was by Rembrandt, the landscape with the Good Samaritan. Now, it's a, it's a religious landscape. Um, the, the painting can all, um, uh, uh, dates to um, 1638 and shows the well-known story um, of Christ, of, of the um, Good Samaritan uh, 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 helping an unfortunate person on the road um, from the New Testament. Um, this painting, um, unlike the other two, can be understood to have entered Isabella's collection by happenstance rather than for a specific need to include um, Rembrandt, the Dutch, great Dutch artist, amongst her holdings. Now, the painting had been brought to Poland um, at a much earlier date, in fact. It had been brought to Poland in the 1774s by the French painter Jean-Pierre Nordblain, who, of course, we have come across before, because who was he? He was Princess Isabella's court painter. 
he purchased the work um, at a sale in Paris just before coming to Warsaw. How the painting entered the collections of, of Isabella is not exactly clear. And Norblin had been invited to Poland by Isabella's husband, Prince Adam Kazimierz Czartoryski, and in, Norblin, in Warsaw, Norblin had um, obviously a lucrative career working not only for the Czartoryskis, but also for other important figures such as the king, Stanislaus Augustus. Now, although Norblin left Poland in 1803, the Rembrandt remained, and it's likely that it entered Isabella's collection through the French artist's connection to her and her family at that point. It's noted as being displayed alongside the Raphael and the Leonardo in the Gothic house in the green room of the Gothic house, no earlier than 1813. Now, Rembrandt was certainly a well-known artist amongst Polish collectors. For example, Isabella's cousin Stanislaus Augustus owned a number of paintings either by Rembrandt or thought at the time to be by that artist. These included such works as Girl in a Picture Frame, The Scholar at His White Writing Dress, and The Portrait of Martin Sulman, and um, The Polish Rider, which is at the Frick now, and is no longer considered to be a work by Rembrandt. Indeed, the princess also noted that she had seen um, a similar landscape to hers, um, a landscape by night with a scene of a campfire um, by Rembrandt when she was in Britain, in fact, when she was a guest of Richard Colt Hoare at Stourhead um, during her tour of England. However, Isabella, as indicated, was not naturally drawn to paintings. Indeed, her handwritten catalogue entry for the landscape by Rembrandt indicates that she did not see the work as particularly significant nor did she see the artist in the most flattering light, and the entry reads thusly. Rembrandt is most valued for his portraits, which are wonderfully true to nature. He is most adept at depicting old men and elderly women. He was also a good printmaker. And then she goes on to be rather disparaging about Rembrandt himself. Rembrandt was peculiarly miserly and greedy, and he was even an odd fellow. He had the bearing of a commoner. His attire was dirty, as was his abode. The famous, the famous Gerard Dew was his pupil. Her reference for works by Dew is also evidenced in a letter, oh, sorry, her preference for works by Dew is also evidenced in a letter she wrote to her cousin, the king, urging him to buy a portrait by Rembrandt because it was very much in the manner of Dew rather than that of his teacher. It's clear that Isabella would have preferred a portrait by Rembrandt, or even better, by Dew, for her growing collections. The comparatively little regard she gave to her Rembrandt is also evidenced in the late identification of the subject of the painting. Isabella considered it only to be a landscape. In the 1828 catalogue, of the collections on display in the Gothic house, it's listed as a landscape with a storm by Rembrandt. And it was only as late as 1878, when the painting found its new home at the Czartoryski Museum in Krakow, that the subject was finally identified. Christ's parable of the Good Samaritan. Isabella cul carefully cultivated her museum at Puave, just as she cultivated the landscape gardening garden it was set in over the next three decades. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, Poland had, to a limited extent, be re been reconstituted as a small kingdom in personal union with Russia, the Tsar sim simultaneously being king of Poland. It was not the independence and Isabella had hoped for, but at least it was peace. Moreover, the Czartoryski family were once again developing political influence. Isabella's son, Prince Adam Jerzy, advised the Russian Emperor Alexander I at the Congress of Vienna in 1814-15. to 15. They were even personal friends, which perhaps put pay to the rumour that Adam Jerzy had had an affair with the Emperor's consort. Adam Jerzy's influence in Poland was so great that the Emperor even quipped that he would not be surprised to hear the announcement of the coronation of King Adam Jerzy Czartoryski as the king. This was to change, however, violently with the accession of Alexander's 
successor, Nicholas I. Unlike his older brother, Alexander, Nicholas firmly believed in autocracy. The relative freedoms granted Poland to Alexander I were intolerable to the new ruler. Poland had been granted its own parliament and constitution under Russian rule. These now Nicholas ignored in his bid to rule his empire as sole autocrat. Poland, with its still separate identity and separatist ambitions, could not be tolerated. The spark that ignited an uprising was Nicholas I's wish to use Polish troops to help put down the French July Revolution. Um, and this um, uprising in Poland was the so-called November Uprising of 1830 to 1831. Young cadet officers rose up in protest and soon unrest spread across what were the former lands of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Polish parliament deposed Nicholas as King of Poland. Prince Adam Jerzy Czartoryski has a central role in the uprising as he was made president of the provisional government of the country. Yet again, Huave was not spared the violence. At the start of the uprising, Princess Isabella wisely evacuated the collections. It was right to do so. On the 6th of December, 1830, Russian forces fleeing Warsaw marched into Puave. The princess arranged for the help of Polish forces in the evacuation of her archive. While she was still undertaking the evacuation of her collection, fighting broke out and the Russian army started bombarding the palace and the estate from the opposite bank of the Vistula River. Despite being 84 years old at the time, the princess stayed until the last. She left her beloved Puave by carriage, carrying the royal casket with her on her journey of escape. She would never again return to her creation. Her son, Adam Yeji, managed to escape to Paris. He was condemned to death um, in absentia and hung in effigy. His estates, including Puave, were irrevocably confiscated. Isabella would spend the last four years of her life at another Czartoryski estate, Sieniawa. In order to erase the memory of the so-called Polish Athens, Nicholas even ordered the renaming of Puave, the village, the estate, the palace. Henceforth, it was to be called New Alexandria, named in honor of his wife, the Empress Court Alexandra. However, hidden away in parish churches, manor houses, as well as at the Palace of Shinyava, Isabella's paintings, historic archive, and mementos waited out this storm. Princess Isabella created a unique model of what a museum could be. Set in a landscape park rather than in a single monumental new building, her museum and its collections, the methods of display, were intended to act directly upon the imagination, to stir up feelings of patriotism or to evoke feelings of pathos. Isabella also displayed a precocious appreciation of Leonardo da Vinci. It was only in the late 1860s the art historians began to once again examine his paintings. Her Museum of Polish History showed remarkable prescience. Open in 1801, the Museum of Polish History, held in the Temple of the Sibyl at Puave, anticipated the next such museological venture, the Museum of the History of France, which was created in the Palace of Versailles by King Louis Philippe in 1833. The inherent quality of the objects Princess Isabella amassed meant that even without the setting she had so carefully cultivated for her collection at Puave, these, collect these objects still had tremendous historic and artistic value. Despite the disaster, Isabella, Isabella's museum was not lost. Like a careful husbandsman, she, has, she had ensured the survival of her, her collection this collection she had so carefully cultivated. I will resort to cliché here and say that the seed Isabella sowed proved hardy. Her museum survived the November uprising and once again would bear fruit when, in 1878, the Czartoryski Museum will once again open to the public in its new home in Krakow.
Thank you.